Coming up, as Asteroid Redirect Mission winds down, Deep Space Gateway gains support. Spooky action in space. I have an interview with Esteban Guzman talking about art and science. <laughs> and I've got comments, all of that and more, coming up on this episode of Tomorrow. Good morning. How's everything up in the sky? Welcome to Orbit 10, episode 22. I almost said dot 22. I guess because that's the way it's in the rundown, and so then it's just inherently, I'm Ron Burgundy, apparently, today. Exactly. Uh, for June 17th, 2017. <laughs> With me, I have a Jared, I have a Mike, and for some reason, I actually still have a Dada. There's a cat in the room and a micro Dada that refuses to join us out in the real world. Mm. Oh my goodness. Yeah, there's a Ben back there somewhere. We Everybody's have here. A fantastic guest lined up for you guys today. But of course, as always, I want to make sure we give a huge shout out to our Patreon members. These people of the Escape Velocity variety. These people have given us $10 or more for this particular segment of this particular episode and continue to be super awesome, which is so great. Uh, if you would also like to be, continue to be super awesome, feel free to head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. Woo! Okay. Wowza. We have so much going on. I know, as always. But, of course, we want to start off with launches. So, Mike, take us away. So, yeah, first uh, launch of this past week was a uh, progress launch, uh, launching on a Soyuz 2-1A rocket. Let's check out the footage. This was the Progress MS-06 spacecraft, which launched on Wednesday, June 14th at 9.20 Coordinated Universal Time from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. And it had on board about 2,739 kilograms, or over 6,000 pounds, of cargo and supplies. Now, that included about 880 kilograms, or almost 2,000 pounds, of fuel to refuel the station's propulsion system, and about 420 kilograms of drinkable water, as well as a little over 47 kilograms of air to replenish the station's atmosphere. And with this launch, they were able to have a successful launch, and Progress was able to, two days later, rendezvous with the International Space Station and dock with it. That occurred on uh, uh, Friday, June 16th at 1137 Coordinated Universal Time. And it, originally, the Progress MS-06 spacecraft was originally scheduled to dock with the PEERS module and undock both itself and the PEERS module at the end of its mission to make room for the troubled Nauka module, which has tentatively been scheduled for launch in late 2018, despite ongoing repairs. Now, both Piers and Progress would re-enter the atmosphere. The Piers module, by the way, is the module kind of in the left corner there that you can see another Progress vehicle docked to, uh, the, the kind of bottom uh, left corner of your screen. And that would have both, both that and the Progress vehicle would have burned up in the atmosphere. But due to delays with the Nauka, this is now plan for the Progress MS-09 mission, also in late 2018. Now, one very sad thing about this launch, though, was that uh, during the launch itself, downrange, one of the recovery personnel lost their lives trying to recover one of the Soyuz boosters when a large gust of wind ignited nearby their truck that they were the driver of, and they apparently were trying to extinguish the fire from that. And although very unfortunate, it just goes to show that all aspects of spaceflight are dangerous, yeah. even the ground operations. So... Thankfully, though, this mission was successful, and uh, the Soyuz with the, uh, the upgraded Soyuz with Progress was able to uh, have a successful mission so far. Good. Good. Um, and there was another launch, yeah? There was a long march? <laughs> Yes, there was. This has been a long-awaited uh, launch of a uh, X-ray telescope that uh, China has been preparing for several years now. So there's not a whole lot of footage of this, and I apologize for the, the, the speaking that's over this, but this is the only uh, footage that we were able to find of this. So let's check it out. <laughs> 
This launched on Thursday, June 15th at 300 Coordinated Universal Time from Launch Complex 43 at the Jiquan Satellite Launch Center. And the spacecraft is called the Hard X-ray Modulation Telescope, or HXMT. And compared with previous orbital X-ray telescopes, HXMT has a larger detection area, broader energy range, and a wider field of view that give it advantages while it's observing the evolution of black holes and powerful magnetic fields of neutron stars. And along with this mission, there was also two small satellites that were uh, both a little under 50 kilograms that were also uh, launched with this mission. So congratulations to China for finally getting this mission uh, launched into space. It was originally scheduled to launch way back in 2010, but it's had quite a few delays. So uh, it's awesome to finally see that get off. And I'm sure Jared's going to be very excited if yes. they even share the, the results of this mission, which I'm pretty sure they will. They are going to. Uh, what they, they sort of they results were. they'll yield. Yeah, because yeah, it's the Chinese Academy of Sciences that's responsible for this, and they are usually yes. very open about their uh, the results that they get from scientific missions like this. Yeah, this is also a new uh, instrument as well to look at x-rays. Most of the time you have extremely flat mirrors with sensors that do that, but uh, this one is not. It's actually sensors at angles, so we're, we're all actually very excited to see what kind of data we get from this mission, so very, very cool. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, speaking of data and missions and other things, <laughs> this is literally in the rundown as wow signal. Yes. Uh, so you're going to have to explain oh, some things wow to me. <laughs> Who likes controversy? <laughs> not, not me particularly. Um, but there is a new study that just came out about the signal that was detected by SETI, which is the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, back in 1977. Um, now, it's called the WOW signal, and that's because when you look at the printout that it was on, somebody circled <laughs> where the signal happened and wrote WOW next to it. Um, so those right. numbers and letters tell you the signal to noise ratio, so the higher the number or the further down the alphabet you go, the better the signal to noise ratio is. So if it was so, like 99ZZ, 99ZZ? Yeah, that, kind of that would be, be like, like crazy whoa, pants? Okay. like, okay, here they come, you Got know, it. kind of thing. All right, just uh, checking. You know, three coming in from Mark 4.6, I don't know. <laughs> um, so this signal was pretty interesting because it happened at 1,420 megahertz, which this is the same frequency that neutral hydrogen emits in the radio spectrum. Um, and this is considered a sweet spot because intelligent life will be studying hydrogen. So scientists in the 70s proposed that if there was other intelligent life out there, mm -hmm. it would know that other intelligent life would be looking at the hydrogen line right there. Sure. And it would emit whatever signals it could to try to communicate gotcha. in that line. So that's not really the line of thinking anymore today, but that's how it was back in the 1970s. Right. Well, Antonio Paris, uh, an astronomer at St. Petersburg College in Florida, has, has actually published a paper claiming that those radio emissions likely came from comets. And it's very interesting because not only are the UFO people not buying it, obviously, because mm -hmm. uh, clearly mm -hmm. it was aliens, uh, the scientists are also... Aliens, but it's probably... Right? Yeah, it, yeah, I'm not saying it was aliens, but, you know. Um, so, <laughs> even the scientists aren't buying this scientific paper as well. Uh, my, <laughs> my favorite quote uh, came from Queen's University in Belfast. Uh, they have an astrophysics division there that studies comets uh, specifically, and their reply to the paper was rubbish. Um, <laughs> because All right. nobody's ever detected 1420 megahertz actually being emitted from a comet before. Um, and Seth Shostak, the senior astronomer at SETI, also agrees that no one's detected anything from a comet being emitted at that radio frequency as well. Another problem with the paper is that the comets claimed to cause the emissions, uh, 266P Christensen, actually wasn't anywhere near close to the part of the sky where the wow signal came from. And uh, it's been very interesting watching uh, the author of the paper and uh, several other scientists uh, going at it over Twitter and Reddit, hashtag science beef. So, the mystery remains as to what the wow signal was, because a lot of people, including myself, really aren't buying that paper that came out that said that. Interesting. So, yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> and wasn't that coming from the, the constellation of Pegasus? Is that where the wow signal yes. was uh, detected from? Yeah, right in that area. So, yeah, very interesting part of the sky. So, hmm. mm -hmm. All right. Very cool. Very, yeah. All cool right. Signal. At least I understood <laughs> that one, so that makes me happy. There you go. Uh, <laughs> Mike? You got some DARPA news. What's going on over there? 
Yeah, so uh, this is something that I've wanted to talk about for a while, and there's been uh, a couple of new developments over the past week regarding this. DARPA has uh, selected the partner that they're going to move forward with on their XS-1, their experimental space plane program, and they've chosen Boeing to be their partner. And uh, Boeing's put out a, a little animation of their kind of uh, their proposal for this, and they're calling their version uh, the Phantom Express, and it's going to be a two-stage vehicle. The first stage isn't necessarily a space plane, it's more like a rocket plane that is going to get high enough to be able to deploy the upper stage to uh, have something that can go into orbit all the way. Way. And this would be for small to medium class rockets. Now, uh, phase, uh, Phantom Express is going to be used in the second and third phases of this experimental program. Phase two is an $146 million award that's going to cover all the ground tests uh, and hopefully have 10 flights in 10 days by the end of 2020. So uh, Boeing is going to be the partner for that. And Boeing supposedly is going to be responsible for that upper stage as well. However, there are possibilities that other people who were competing in the program Program might still be able to, to be a part of this program, okay. such as the, the, the Maston Aerospace team that was working with x -Corps, as well as uh, the Northrop Grumman team uh, that was working with Virgin Galactic. So there might still be a little bit of possibilities for this. But if it works, this would could potentially lower the price quite a bit. And I'm sure, or, or rather I would hope, that Boeing would be able to market this uh, commercially themselves to have another, um, uh, their reusable rocket, so to speak. Yeah. Um, but uh, something else that I did want to mention is that Aerojet Rocketdyne is going to be the contractor for the engine. They're going to be using the space shuttle main engines, or the RS-25s, only one of them, as the, the, the main propulsion on that first stage for that rocket plane. Hmm. Um, and recently, Dar DARPA spokespeople have confirmed that the XS-1 is going to be based out of Cape Canaveral. Um, if you could go to the fourth picture, please. Uh, they are going to be launching, they haven't said exactly which pad they're going to be launching out of, but they're probably going to be operating out of the same facilities where they operate the X-37B. Hmm. And they're definitely going, they did announce that they are definitely going to be using the Kennedy Space Shuttle uh, landing facility as well as the skid strip that's at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station to do test landings and possibly operational landings of the Phantom Express. Now, speaking of the X-37B program, the Air Force did recently announce that the next flight, the next mission, the next launch of an X-37B is going to be on SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket <laughs> and not United Launch Alliance's Atlas V. It's an and interesting, a like, web of... <laughs> <laughs> things like i don't even know how to yeah. like all right cool yeah <laughs> and even tori bruno the uh the, the ceo of united launch line said that they didn't even have a chance to bid on on that so uh supposedly that mission uh, is supposed to launch like within the next six months so i'm going to be very interested to see uh, if they're going to be ready in time but yeah it's definitely an interesting uh, turn of events here um but yeah, uh, Boeing also builds the X-37B, so yeah, I think it's interesting that they are focusing on this rocket plane stuff and uh, not really worrying about uh, too much about the reusability thing. So yeah. in any case, I'm sad for Maston, but I hope that there's more opportunities for, for Maston Aerospace as well. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. I mean, we all do. Close personal friend of the show, Maston. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> dreamy Dave. Right, Dreamy Dave. <laughs> um, <laughs> as opposed, you know, also, you know, close personal friend of the show, Tori Bruno. So mm -hmm. there's that too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to throw that out there. I figure I might as well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all friends. <laughs> right, so, exactly. Yeah. All ships rise of the tide. Exactly. So I think we all agree at that point. Um, all right, so Jared, <laughs> you're killing me on your headlines here, man. Trust me. <laughs> this, <laughs> I'm killing myself talking about this, but I'm going to give it a shot. This is so. China Test Spooky <clears throat> Action at a Distance in Space. <laughs> yes, it sounds like a really funny thing. But it's that is... like the weirdest like balderdash like grouping of words together that are all English, and yet I have no <laughs> idea what they mean. <laughs> spooky <laughs> Action at a Distance is probably my favorite actual scientific term Ever. I mean, it's just, it just sounds spooky action at a distance. Oh my gosh. As opposed so, to like really close in your face? Yeah, as opposed to spooky action at a couch. I don't know. Sure. Um, right. That just brings just up. Regular life. Yeah, let's not. Right. We're stopping. I'm sorry. Anyways, my bad. Um, so, a team of scientists in China have actually used a satellite to test what's called quantum entanglement. Mm -hmm. And they've done it over the longest distance anyone has ever done it, about 1,200 kilometers. Okay. Um, so, 
Quantum entanglement is also known as spooky action at a distance, and that term was actually created by Albert Einstein because he did not feel that quantum theory was very solid. So, like, you know how we'll sometimes be like, that's a bunch of mumbo jumbo. Right. So Einstein was like, that's just a bunch of spooky action at the distance. Okay. So, um, basically, what happens is that you have an entangled pair of particles, uh -huh. and they can actually change instantly when measured, even if those pair of particles are thousands of light years away. That's basically what the theory says. All right. And the wildest thing is that in practice, if you actually go to the laboratory, mm -hmm. it happens. It's weird. It's really... Is I, that like twins, like when one gets sick in Wisconsin and the other one feels it, but he's in Iowa? Yes. Like that. It's exactly like that. All right. In fact, I think that's how it happens. <laughs> so the best part about this is that no one understands the mechanics as to why it works. It just simply does. So basically, this uh, satellite, which is in these images right here, that uh, is Space Mike wanted me to point out, that is not the quantum wave coming uh, from the satellite. You can't actually see it. That is a laser. Yeah, because I was like, that is that straight is spooky. Huge. So yeah, I agree yeah, with that. So, <laughs> All right, lasers, got it. Uh, it's a laser that they're firing with the, uh, with the entangled pair of particles in there. Mm -hmm. um, now, China's been working on this satellite since the 1990s. And uh, what's so cool about this experiment is that the applications are almost endless. Um, just like when we discovered photons, people were like, what's the point? Uh, well, now photons are kind of important for like everything uh, that you use. So you could do things like un truly unbreakable communication encryptions, uh, extremely precise navigation systems, and potentially uh, exponential speed gains for computers. So there's a multitude of applications that something like this can be used. And it's so cool to see that not only are we in the early stages of this, but we're using space in order to get ourselves into the early stages of this. Huh. So there you go. There's some spooky action at a distance. So. All right. <laughs> I think we need that on a t-shirt. Yeah. All right. That's enough quantum for one day. All right. Day. You're good? Yes. Yeah. That was. I'm fine. That was a lot. That was yeah. really heavy. Uh, <laughs> Well, this one doesn't seem any lighter. Mike, <laughs> we're talking about asteroid redirect winding down and Deep Space Gateway gain support. Oh my gosh. We're all mm -hmm. going to die. What is happening? And I have to talk about both of these things because they're connected. Yeah, um, no, for so... sure. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> Um, so NASA Asteroid uh, Redirect, or NASA ARM, is the mission that was supposed to go to a near-Earth asteroid and extract a boulder and bring that back either into lunar orbit or into a closer Earth orbit. Mm -hmm. And uh, with these, uh, the NASA Asteroid Redirect mission has received a notice of defunding from, the, uh, from NASA leadership in April, weeks after a budget proposal for the fiscal, fiscal year 2018 was released by the White House um, that called for the cancellation of the mission. Now, N NASA has emphasized, even though they're in the final phases of winding down this program, that key technologies are being developed, uh, that are being developed for ARM will continue. The best known of these is the solar electric propulsion that's going to be used in the early 2020s as the power propulsion module for the Deep Space Gateway. That's the outpost that NASA has proposed uh, to put into cislunar space. Now, um, other elements of NASA ARM are going to be preserved, such as uh, increased funding for near-Earth asteroid searches and planetary defense techniques. And I'm sure that means probably looking up studies at different ways that we could potentially deflect these uh, uh, potentially dangerous near-Earth asteroids. Uh, meanwhile, though, um, NASA's Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel has endorsed the plan to, to build and use the Deep Space Gateway and has praised the practice of, uh, or rather, the idea of using lots of different practice missions at this Deep Space Gateway in order to get ready for crewed interplanetary journeys to Mars. They went even so far as to say that the panel acknowledges a lot of progress that has been made and believes NASA is on the right track, and that while the timelines on some of these missions may seem lengthy, when one considers all of the technical challenges that need to be addressed and the constraints on resources, NASA appears to have a very credible plan going forward. And I really like this plan. Not only does it enable doing these practice missions, uh, I mean, they're going to do another one-year mission and even a two-year mission to see if, <laughs> make sure that crews don't get cabin fever on, on the, the, the enclosed uh, journey to Mars in the yeah. first place. Even if we have a larger habitat, even if you have something really big, you could still lose your mind, you know, on a two-year journey <laughs> like that. 
you know, one year there and one year back, plus of whatever amount of time you're going to actually stay in orbit around Mars. So not only that, but we need to make sure that we actually can do this safely and test out the protections um, or the, the rather different methods to protect crews from the, the harsh radiation of interplanetary space. So um, we definitely need to work out these challenges, and this is a great place to do it. And it's, it's kind of almost like the, the best of both worlds to me because it's, it's almost satisfying the moon first crowd. Mm -hmm. Even though we're not going to the surface, the space station will enable our international partners to go to the surface of the moon. We totally want to work with our international partners mm -hmm. like Russia and potentially even China, even though they're not our partners and we're banned from working with them, to enable their human program to go to the surface of the moon. And if we do cooperate with them, how nice would it be to be able to hitch a ride on one of those uh, lunar landing missions? <laughs> yeah. But um, that's just wishful thinking on my part. But this helps all of those, including commercial missions too, which I haven't even got into. So yeah. I like it, and so does the uh, NASA Safety Advisory Panel. So I think that this is definitely going to be uh, moving forward and hopefully won't get canceled in the next administration. Great. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hopefully. Sorry. <laughs> all those things. Lots of stuff. <laughs> Um, all right, and Jared, you got uh, you got some pretty pictures. Yeah, I've got some really pretty pictures. So we um, haven't checked in on Hubble in a while. Yeah, we haven't, and Hubble's you know still working, still doing amazing work. We didn't shut that down. No, we didn't. Oh, okay. So when uh, NASA shut down, we didn't shut down Hubble. No, no, <laughs> um, it's still working. Just Anyways, um, so. Uh, <laughs> Some European astronomers used Hubble for a very precise type of measurement called astrometry. Astrometry astronomy. Mm -hmm. So uh, say that like 20 times fast. Um, and they looked at two brown dwarfs that are in a system called Lumen 16AB, which is actually the third closest system to our sun, only about six light years away from us. What they did is they took 12 images over a three-year period that actually allows us to see their proper motion. So most of the time in astronomy, when we look at things, they don't appear to be moving even though they actually are. So if you take these images over very long periods of time, you can actually get motion out of them like this. That's what they're doing in the sky. Oh. As they orbit each other, they kind of swing around like that. Oh. So that's three years of data put into an animation. And they were using Hubble to verify if data from the European Southern Observatory's very large telescope indicated that there was actually an exoplanet around those stars. Um, but Hubble, being very precise, was able to prove that there currently is not a, de a currently detectable exoplanet in that system. And out of it, we got to see the proper motion of a system, which we don't get to see this very often. So this was a very exciting uh, paper that came through. So yeah. very, very cool result that they got from that. It so, is. Yeah. Oh, I love pretty pictures. Look at them. They're dancing. They are dancing. They're dancing <laughs> together. <laughs> it's so pretty. Oh my goodness. All right. I think we do have time for one more. Uh, <laughs> so Mike, this is so great. I love that you opened up uh, the show with some launches and then we're ending the news segment with some almost launches. Uh, <laughs> 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 well, right. I mean, sort of, yeah. Yeah. Well, you don't know. I know because I'm looking at the launches, rundown. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> tell me more about what Orbital ATK is doing. So yeah, this is a um, this a disclaimer. This may upset some folks, but Orbital ATK has um, once again tested the abort motor that's going to be used on the launch abort system for the Orion capsule. Mm -hmm. um, this test was already completed uh, quite a while ago, back in the Constellation program. Mm -hmm. But yet here it is again. So there's a little bit of footage of not only the abort motor, but also the attitude control motor and the jettison motor. Let's check it out. So yeah, this test was done on Thursday, June 15th of this week, uh, of this week. but the attitude control motor for the launch abort system, they recently did a second test of that back on April 27th, and that's this test right here. Now, you also may remember that the jettison motor that pulls away the abort motor and these attitude controls, that was also tested last year by Aerojet Rocketdyne. Mm -hmm. And that happened on August 31st of 2016. And as I said, all of these tests have already been completed before. But here's the part where this makes sense to me. All of the contractors that built these three different systems to make the launch abort system have either merged or evolved. ATK was the original uh, 
There's the test for the jettison motor. Nice. ATK was originally just doing the abort motor, and then they merged with Orbital Sciences. And Orbital Sciences was the one who was doing just the attitude control motor. So now AT Orbital ATK is doing both the abort motor and the attitude control motor. And then Aerojet, uh, even though they still have the contract for that, they merged with Aerojet Rocketdyne. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different shuffling uh, of that right there, too. So real quickly, I wanted to show these old tests and also a full pad abort test that they've already done with a full-up launch abort system and the Orion capsule. So <laughs> here's the old ones uh, that uh, were done uh, back in 2008 and 2010. So they've already tested all of these systems before, and it turns out that even though they completed a full-up pad abort test, which is, you can see launching there, oh, yeah. on May 10th of 2010, using the boilerplate Orion that had parachutes and everything, Constellation, which was what this was supposed to be for, was canceled in February of 2010. So even though it's the same hardware for a slightly different Orion, technically they do have different contractors, even though it's the same contractors, mm -hmm. and it's for a different human spaceflight program. So that, in my mind, even though it might seem like a waste of money, does justify a second full-up pad abort test to occur uh, late in 2018. It's actually supposed to occur after Exploration Mission 1, um, unless Exploration Mission 1 gets pushed back even farther. And despite this, this is why programs need to have uh, safeguards and insurance policies in place for when uh, administrations change because the launch abort system, the contract for it was technically canceled. And so they had to redraw up all of the contracts to build the launch abort system again, even though it's technically the same companies, they're you know different now that they're merged. So this test, even though, even though they've already done it before and proved that it works, is justified. They still need to make sure that they can make sure it works and make sure that the people involved you know, are, are skilled enough to do it. So I mean, I feel yeah. like that's a totally legit thing. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I, I, yeah, I can appreciate that. It was, they I mean, they probably I, think it sucks, because they're like, we already did this, but I think it's great. That was my attitude when I first heard of this. I was like, we've already done this stuff. And like in the articles and the press releases talking about it, they're like, oh, yeah, we're doing the first test of the launch abort motor. I'm like, no, we already did. I remember <laughs> right. us doing this test before. This isn't the first one. Right. It, that's uh. funny. Well, it's sort of like breaking up with a significant other, and then like five years down the road, you get back together, and you're like, okay, but don't yeah. be crappy like you were, because otherwise we're going to break up again. Like, <laughs> <I'm>... <laughs> like, you need to prove yourself to me one more time. Yeah, I'm not sure, but maybe there was enough differences between the multi-purpose crew vehicle in Constellation and Orion post-Constellation that maybe they had to I mean, that, redesign something. Yeah, that is an so, excellent point. Like, yeah, if, yeah if, weight if, differences and right. stuff. They might have had yeah. to increase or even decrease the thrust on any three of those systems yeah. of the launch abort system. So, yeah, there's definitely justifiable reasons for wanting to do this again and make sure that it works. That's yeah. that's that's the point of this story, Plus, I believe. Yeah. Fire always looks cool, so there's that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, abort motors are awesome. I mean, they're going to leave bruises on, and maybe crack a rib, but you're going to live at least. So Yeah, I'll take that. Yeah. No yeah. problem. I will too. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, I think that's all we got for news this mm -hmm. week, which is really great. We got everything in. I'm, I'm really proud of us. Good job, guys. Good job, everyone. <laughs> we did it. We did. Gold star. We didn't skip anything this week, you guys. We gave you all of the news that we had. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> but we are going to take a break so that we can sit down for a bit. And then uh, when we come back, we, Ben actually has got a great interview with Estevan Guzman talking about space art. So Ooh. one of my favorite topics. I love pretty pictures. All right. So stay <laughs> with us. We'll be right back. <laughs> And welcome back to tomorrow. Now, before we get started with this week's interview, I did want to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are people who have contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. We also have our orbital patrons. These are people who have contributed $5 or more to this specific episode. To find out how you can help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com 
slash T-M-R-O. All right, I am joined this week by Estevan Guzman. Did I get it right? Yeah, you got it right. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, you, work, uh, you work up at the Griffith Observatory. I do, yeah. That's, that's easy to say. Uh, and you work, uh, you're uh, an uh, illustrator artist up over there. I'm an illustrator and animator up animator, there. Animator, I'm sorry, yeah. illustrator and animator. And, and what, do, what does that mean? Uh, that means we in the studio produce our own planetarium shows. There's only a few places in the entire world that produce their own planetarium shows, and I'm happy to be part of one of the observatories that does create their own. And so we're in the process of making a new show. Fortunately, I can't say too much about it right now, but we are currently in pre-development into making something I hope really reaches people. So uh, let's talk a little bit about um, art and STEM. Okay. Uh, so do you feel that, so there's this kind of STEM and STEAM debate, right? right? It, you know, science, technology, engineering, math, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Uh, do you think that arts are important in that, or is it kind of the, a separate thing and they, they don't really collide at all? No, I think, I think they do, it should play a role in STEM or STEAM, because it's part of this development of just trying to make the world a better place in the way of people, like when people think of genius and intelligence, they think of innovators like Elon Musk or Albert Einstein, you know. But are much as, as integral as science and math and agriculture is to um, civilization, art has been there the entire way. It's one of the defining features of a civilization that we're able to create art. art is everywhere, you know, no matter what kind of person you are, whether you're a physicist, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a mechanic, you're, you like art in some form. You have art on your t-shirt. There's movies, you know, commercials, TV. Art's everywhere. It's part of our civilization. And it's something that should be, you know, invested more into. I think people tend to think when Especially, you know, in, like a lot of politicians, they think art. They think arts and crafts, artsy farts. You know, it's something you do as a hobby. You don't, know, you know, how many times you ever heard that one. But art is what makes humans human, and I think it definitely does need to make. It needs to put the heat and steam. Is there an engineering advantage to also having good um, artistic sense or good design sense when you're building? I mean, rockets are round. Right, they're ra they're round for engineering yeah. reasons. Sure. Uh, is there is there any artistic advantage to any of that? To putting um, an artistic flair like on a rocket or something. Sure. Like I mean, that. let's let's look at like um, uh, again the views and opinions expressed in the show, blah blah blah. But um, you know, let's take a Dragon uh, Two, sure. the Crew Dragon vehicle, and a, an Orion capsule. Mm -hmm. The Dragon looks it's like something out of the future. Yeah. It's I mean, it's designed beautifully. And then you've got Orion that looks like something out of the past. Hmm. It's not designed beautifully, uh, <laughs> and, but they both do the same thing. Is there is there any engineering advantage to the thing, or is there any? It doesn't even have to be an engineering advantage. Right. Is there any advantage to the thing that is cool looking too? Well, there's this aspect that when we think of engineering things, like we think of cars and boats and airplanes, things that have to, like just based on utility, have to have a streamline look to them because they need that allows them to move quicker to the air, makes them more aerodynamic. Rockets don't need that, you know, they just have to work. I would love, you know, rockets to like look like the rockets from the 50s, these, these nice conical slender oh, like tubes, like that one right there, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's beautiful looking. Yeah. Um, Surprisingly, though, uh, at the studio, we are more forgiving when it comes to space travel, especially now because we're still young and relatively young and, you know, us exploring space. But we're kind of just like, let's just get up there first, you know, like, you know, the, you know, the old the original cars, you know, they just kind of had, they're just a lever and they're just these hunks of machinery that just had wheels and then, you know, they didn't look pretty or anything. People look up like, you know, they put them on a pedestal because they're the first cars, you know. And, you know, people do that with, like, the Saturn V rocket, which to me, I kind of find a beautiful rocket, you know. Like, I, I, I find, I do find beauty in just something's ability to do unbelievable things, you know. There's an artistry in that. There's an artistry in, like, just figuring out how to do things like the, uh, 
the grand tour. I think that's a beautiful piece of art of just having to figure out how to take the little budget they had, but using, figuring out just the math of how to get this probe around the planets just so they can get to all of them. You know, I think they're only funded to go to Jupiter or Saturn, right? And they used gravitational assist to get to Neptune and Uranus too. Um, but in terms of just in a broader picture, which I think definitely oftentimes people should think about more like the big, I like, you know, when people today in, in the politics of it, they want immediate action. They want an immediate payoff. And there's not big ideas on investment, you know, and you have my drawing up here, which is, you know, it's not a very, um, it's, it's what, like a space, did. so this is a, a image I made of, you know, just two astronauts going to visit uh, Pluto, which is, I painted this shortly after New Horizons visited um, Dwarf Worlds. And you, you mean the planet Pluto? The planet, it's clearly a planet, not a dwarf planet, but a full, <laughs> actual planet. I don't care what it is, honestly. It's it's beautiful. It has a heart on it. It does. It's it has. A, it is. It's beautiful. It's, it has like geology to it. Yeah, it's yeah. incredible place. Like yeah, people. Whenever people ask me about Pluto, I say, you know, no one cared about the classification of Pluto until they decided to make it not a planet. And what I usually tell people is, it shouldn't make you sad about Pluto. It should make you curious onto what are the other dwarf planets? Because there's five other ones that not everyone knows about. I'm sure most people watching the show clearly knows like you have Ceres, Eris, Haumea, Maki Maki, um, and, some, but, and some other ones that haven't been officially designated. But for all intents and purposes, like Quoar and Sedna, just like, I'm, sometimes I just want to get to the International Astronomical Union, just like, just commit, guys. Just commit and name the dwarf planets for one. Well, it's funny, actually, I went the other way, uh, which is, okay, now it opened my curiosity as to how do we define a planet? And it's amazing how quickly that becomes a very complicated question. Yeah. That is not easy to answer. And then like, oh, well, we should, you know, if, as soon as you start adding Pluto in, then you start having to add like our moon in sure. and other I things. It. Like, well, that doesn't feel right either. So yeah, it was, it, it creates, I think, an interesting conversation. It's just semantics, honestly. There's an asteroid with a ring around it, you know, <laughs> that not many people, I forgot its name, but that's something I want to see, you know, it's, so, and some moons are more interesting than planets. Like we should call it Sasteroid. After Saturn, Sasteroid, that'd be fun. <laughs> and, and, and every time, like, and because it's very sassy, too. <laughs> um, but going back to the question of, you know, utilitarian components, right now I'm just kind of like, let's get there. But in terms of investing in art, you know, the thing, every scientist or every, like, space engineer usually has their roots their beginning as a kid who watched science fiction. You know, like people watched Star Trek and that inspired, that was the first time an engineer who worked on, uh, who's working on Dawn, who's, that's currently around the series, it's the first time he ever heard of the concept of the ion drive. It was on Star Trek. And now he uses it to power the Dawn probe. And you know, it's, and so when it comes to like designing a ship that looks aesthetically beautiful, that's the kind of thing that does capture the imagination of not anyone now, but we would totally see the impact of it, you know, maybe 20 years down the line when that kid, you know, works at SpaceX or works for NASA and he develops a rocket that gets us to Mars. There's also like this giant and immense beauty just in the cosmos itself. Yes. Right? You, you, we have Juno Cam, which is Jared love to point out at any opportunity he has. Almost didn't make it. It wasn't supposed to be on the, the vehicle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and the imagery coming back is just stunning. It's stunning. And yeah, when the, we were talking about that, um, because um, the space artists out there, like, you know, we've, we always look for reference. And this is my um, interpretation of Juno flying by uh, Jupiter. And we were just thinking of like, you know, it's really like hard that, it's, it's really upsetting that they don't get the concept of having to put a camera onto a probe. And kind of, it, this is, you know, it makes me upset as a taxpayer too, because like, hey, you're gonna, like the science is great, we want the science, put a camera on it, you know? This is what, at the very least, this is what people want. This is the people 
who you're representing. This is the people who are funny. This is not me, by the way. We're well, we'll get into this. Well, a yeah, bit later. Talk, I, so we'll, yeah. we'll pause that. that. I mean, that's a really good yeah. point. But what, so what are we looking at here? Okay, so this is an early illustration of what Jupiter looked like, and so this is what I usually when I, you know when I talk about like the history of space art. I kind of you know think back to where its roots are. You know, I'm trying to think back, and there's kind of like it has like you know connections with spiritual and religious art in a way not like you know directly or anything but in a way because many of a lot of the first art for many civilizations starts off as you know depicting a deity you know space art to me has always been you showing people what they can't see for themselves and initially that's what religious art is you know you Ha this to them that was their cosmos that was their world and thinking back in medieval times that this is they were depicting their cosmos their gods their what they couldn't inter they, t they took what they knew and they interpret it into some way that was something visual for people to better connect with here's some other illustrations of looking back so but probably the very first space artist would have to be Galileo, who did some illustrations of the moon. He saw the mountains and the valleys. He saw the crescent, Venus. He saw the big dot of Jupiter and the four little dots going around it. And what he was trying to do is there was no cameras back then, you know? There's barely lenses for telescopes. Um, and so he illustrated these things to connect further with people like this is what I'm seeing and this is what these illustrations represent they are connecting people to the cosmos in a way that they can't and then you know give it a couple hundred years cameras come along and all of a sudden you can take pictures of the planets you know because not everyone has a telescope you know you got to be able to communicate what you're seeing so people can fund and back up what you're trying to show them and so when the camera came, the question begins then, is there a need, let me ask you this. So once the camera took a picture of the planet and people can have actual f pictures of planets, is there a need for a space artist anymore? Mm, that's an interesting question. I would argue yes, because you still want to have art and inspiration in the things that you can't yet see through that camera lens. Exactly, and that is the role of the space artist. The space artist takes and what like you know what my driving thing is you know when I create my art or I'm working on the planetarium I our idea is we take what we know and we just try to go just a little bit further you know we try to just go like uh, so like so right here here's my illustration of Pluto and it got two astronauts and I always put two astronauts because I like the idea of wherever we go we're not going alone we're going mm -hmm. together um, so we got all those beautiful pictures of Pluto, right? Now the space artist is like, all right, let's take you down. The, the artist always makes it more personal, you know, you, like, or at least for me, mm -hmm. not everybody, but at least for me, I try to like, what would it be like to actually be there, you know? Some, and there's some great art where like, it's more fantastic. Like, you know, someone would put the Milky Way in the background and put a bunch of stars back there. Um, if we go back to the other one really quickly. Go back. I'll talk about this one a little bit. Oh, there you uh, go, there you go. Uh, this is like, you know, it's like you, like how on the moon, you, wouldn't, you might not see, you probably wouldn't see stars from the surface of Pluto, even though it's really dim out there. Um, I wanted to get that, just that little hint of a blue atmosphere. You got Karen right there, and I think that's Hydra I put in the background. And the idea is just you take what you know and you try to interpret it in a way that makes it feel like what would it actually like to be there. And we probably won't get to Pluto for some time. And so space artists have a job until then. But even then, you know. <laughs> that feels like that should be on a shirt. <laughs> we won't get to Pluto for some time, so space, art space artists have a job for, some, for a while. Yeah. Well, I, the way I always liked it, and, and me and my coworkers have come up with this kind of motto when it comes to space art, which is 
we're, we we try like you know we talk to scientists and like what like what's probably there what's probably not there and you know when they well, sometimes like you know maybe it's not there we're kind of like all right you know what we like it if you disagree prove us wrong and fund a mission <laughs> <laughs> So I, I do have a, at least one question from the chat room from sure. Wicked asking, uh, basically, what, what kind of hardware and software do you use to make um, these images? And then we'll extend that also. So we'll say some of the images, what do you use for hardware and software? And then you're talking about doing a new planetarium show. Yeah. What does it take to build something like that? Because that's got to be way more intense. OK, so my illustrations there are, I use a Photoshop and I use a pen, you know, and I draw everything on there. Some people you know, like to grab textures and like, you know, make that the sand or something, like add to it, like, and that's fine, you know, but I like making sure like everything I do, like, like especially if it's like, you know, if it's quick, something I need to do quick, you mm -hmm. know, like concept art, it's great for concept art, you know, you can grab a reference photo and alter it a little bit and make it something more, but if it's like my personal art, I want to make sure that every stroke of the pen is me. Um, and what was, what was the second part? Oh, the, oh so the, okay, so yeah. you basically Photoshop, Photoshop, and Illustrator, I assume. Illustrator. Not really illustrated, just kind of. I try to keep it because I, I, at heart, want to be a traditional illustrator. You know, I want to use colored pencils, I want to use mm. pens, I want to use paint. But unfortunately, that's not where the medium is going right now. Everything is digital. And to keep up, you know, you got to learn how to do that. But, I, but my uh, median halfway is I'm doing that, but I'm do, I draw in a way that is applicable to how I would draw a painting. My mentors at the observatory, Chris Butler and Don Dixon, I consider them, I'm their Padawan. They are <laughs> great. They, some unbelievable, like, um, I, I wish I upload, but this is something people could he look up. Um, Don Dixon, back in 1979, he illustrated for a book cover um, an, Im a, an image of Pluto, right? And he's a smart guy. He actually like thinks like, all right, well, at this temperature, this element would come up to the air and fall back down and kind of create these textures. And this is probably what would be like, you know, just tholins in there, so it'd be a little bit tinted red. And he just made this book cover. And then, could you not, 30 years later, however long time it was between 1979 and when New Horizons passed by, um, there's an image that is spookily <laughs> looks just like his painting. And so sometimes space artists get it right. And actually, uh, Phil Plate, I think, mentioned, like, why do we even send a mes mission? Let's just have this guy paint what we <laughs> eat that was just there. And believe it or not, he actually, it's not as big, but he has a small heart on Pluto that's just created by asteroid impacts. Huh. Um, huh. But the way, like, that's got to be pure happenstance, right? It's I mean, pure happenstance. Yeah, okay. No, he had no idea. Others, he, he's part of a conspiracy. <laughs> but I kind of to say that. <laughs> no, but but those guys are great. And like, you know, you go in, and you know, I was in my own bubble. Like, you know, like, for like, you know, in college, like, you know, I, I, you know, I started art, like, but I focused on space art, and like, you know, didn't meet too many space artists. You know, I found like my little niche, and. But once you meet other people who are embedded in it and are great at it, it's just like, it's a whole other level, you know? It's just like, these guys are wicked smart and there's like no way I could ever, like, I, okay, I maybe one day will, but, you know, these guys are the people I look up to. The name is... Uh, Someday you can become a master Jedi. Hopefully I will do too. <laughs> Um, but back to the hardware. The, so the hardware for the Planetarium show is um, where we're... Because, I mean, it's a bit more intense, right? It is they, intense, you've yeah. got You've got this huge theater, and you've got, I'm assuming, insane resolution on that. And if, if you're rendering things out, you know, you're not just making an, an image. You have to make yeah. however many of those you're doing per second, 24 to 60, I assume. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just a lot of... Like we're like, cause we're like we're just starting to use, learn like new softwares right now, mm -hmm. and it's just it's a high learning curve, and like you just want to smash your head in sometime <laughs> because uh, you are trying to figure out like what is wrong. I I'm doing everything you told me, and yet you're not working, and you just kind of have to you know step like just retrace your steps and like try to figure out what you did wrong. Um, but one of the things that you know we tried and like and credit to everyone 
just the people who develop the show, they really wanted space artists first, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, we'll get animators and they're great, you know, we've had some animators come in and they're great, but they really wanted like the aesthetic that we brought to the show. Well, kind of like you were talking about, take the science of how the chemicals react and yeah. actually understand what we really think is what might actually look like. Yeah. I mean, that, that's more than just art, that's science and art blended together. Yeah, and getting back to like, and like just in general of like space, and just scientific art, there's some bad stuff out there, you know. Some of it is more like, and it kind of, it's kind of disappointing because this is the thing that's going to capture people the most. Um, there's some good, there's a lot of great stuff out there, but there's some, like I, f I find a lot, a lot of the official NASA stuff is just more like utilitarian of like, all right, here's a planet, here's a star, you know. There's no real like. It's some making, of their stuff. Some like, of it. Like some, some of their like Juno stuff. I want to say like their Juno yeah. animation. Was it Juno? I think it was Juno, um, or certainly MSL. It, yeah, there's some. Oh, there's some great stuff out there. Like they did this Cassini one. Um, I think it was, it was JPL or something. They did the Cassini flyby. That's beautiful. I uh, think most of the stuff that comes out of JPL is pretty fantastic. It's pretty though. fantastic. Yeah. There's a, a short movie called Wanderers. Oh yeah, which, but that wasn't JPL. No, that wasn't. No. That's incredible. That, we actually, I love that so much. We contacted that animator to help us with our open. Okay. Yeah. yeah oh yeah. Yeah. That's. That that was inspiring. Like us at the show, we're just like, wow. All right. If you if, for anyone watching, if you've not seen the short Wanderers, um, just search. I think Google or Vimeo for Wanderers, like Cosmos, yeah. and it's it's it truly is. It's beautiful. Yeah. And there's a second one. I think probably made it, it's uh it's about New Horizons. But before they get to Pluto, they show all the different uh, satellites that go by. It's the first mission to each world. And yeah, that stuff is like, like when I see something like that, I'm initially like, wow, man, challenge accepted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, got another question from the chat room, which is from Jack, asking, uh, what would you say is your signature? Uh, in terms of what? Like, That's the entire question. But you know how most artists sign their work? Uh, yeah, I assume yeah. you're not going to be able to sign your planetarium work per se. No. Other than maybe your name possibly at the end. So we, do you have like a thing like, uh, for example, <laughs> we, have, uh, we have an artist in our yeah. front lobby, uh, front lobby, uh, front uh, whatever of our house, yeah. who always puts rocks. Like he, he's trying to get the rocks out of his head. Always puts rocks yeah. into his photos. Do you have anything like that? Where you're, you know, you mentioned like you always have two. It's you always try to have two astronauts. astronauts. Yeah. Uh, like, can we expect the same thing in the planetarium show? When you see people, there always be two of them. I can't speak to that kind of thing <laughs> in specifics. All right, but how about just a signature, okay. like something? Okay, you would... so okay, this is something my dad has always wanted. Like he, everything I do, he wants me to sneak in my signature. And I'll, I'll, sp I'll speak generally, I won't speak any specifics. Like let's say, and this is not the example, so um, <laughs> please don't. We're not allowed to know the All right, no, all right, no, right so yeah. this, is, this is not the example, but like let's say, you know, let's say there's grass or something, mm -hmm. right? Um, I would, like, and let's say someone was mowing the lawn, mm -hmm. the, like the, the part they mowed would be my signature, something like mm -hmm. that, you know? Um, you just sneak it in there where, only if you knew where to look, you would see it. Because my signature is, it's, it's three lines and a G going through the bottom third line. And so it's pretty easy to hide. But, you know, I, I did. So now, anyway, I, I so uh, not saying you're going to put it in the planetarium show, no. but you, you should, def I'm definitely going to watch for it. I'll have to go a couple times to oh, see if I can I'm find it. I'm not saying, no, I'm not saying. I, 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 I'm not saying you are, <laughs> but I'm also not saying you're not. No, at the beginning, I, at the beginning, I did it a lot, but, you know, young artist. But then since then, that stuff, like that was just practice stuff. And since then, I haven't put it in, I, I actually haven't put it in anything since. But because, you know, it's just to me, it's just like, the focus is on the work. You know, it's not about me. So, you know, I'm not as, you know, interested in making sure people know it's me. People know me, you know. I have another question from Sarge Enzyme. Um, uh, uh, I think we're going to have to take some liberties with this particular one because I'm not entirely sure how to word it. But uh, life usually follows art or is inspired by all art. For example, Star Wars, Star Trek. What do you see as inspiring the new and current scientists? Okay, actually, I think that was self-explanatory. Okay. So what's inspiring? 
See, this is a problem I've had. Like, I'm a huge science fiction fan, you know. My sure. wallet is a Star Trek, and... Well, it's only it, science fiction until it isn't anymore. Until it isn't anymore, exactly. I have a lot of problems with sci-fi today. In, like, like, when you look at sci-fi in the 60s, it was forward thinking. It was, let's do the crazy stuff that's coming out there. Like, you think of Star Trek, you think of... They had a cell phone, they had a teleporter, they had all these great things. And there's some great sci-fi today in terms of plot, but not in terms of forward thinking. Like Battlestar Galactica, I love Battlestar Galactica, great plot, but there wasn't anything new about it. Like, well, spaceship, that's standard. There's nothing, you know, particularly interesting. Like, well, spaceships are always interesting, but there's nothing innovative about a spaceship. Like, I'm waiting for someone to come up with the next, you know, crazy invention that like, you know, is nuts. There's a new show called The Expanse that yep. I'm currently in love with right now. Great plot, but again, not technology that isn't too within the next 30 years that we won't have. You know, they have rail guns and things like that. But, um, and so now here's where I we have begin. Rail guns. That's technology from today. Isn't okay. It? Yeah. yeah. Or they, I'm just thinking of like in their sense, oh, like sure. you know, like they're on everything, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but and so this is where I, this is so it all, any beginning conversation with me ends up me talking about my comic book because I'm also I'm not a published science fiction writer, but I've created two sci-fi comics that I never I didn't think were ready and I'm trying to work on a third one right now like you know work is totally just eating up all my time and I have all these other art projects that I have to get to before I get to my comic but you know I, I'm trying to go and in, back into that sense of like let's show people a, a future world that would be as alien and unusual like if you brought Thomas Jefferson to the future today and what he would think about it, you know? I've always wondered what that would happen is if you were to take someone from like even a hundred years ago and bring them yeah. to modern day civilization but in terms of sci-fi and what like what's in like there's always going to be like sci like shows there's always going to be sci-fi out there that's going to inspire someone to get into space and rocks and stuff like that but you know like the expanse battlestar galactica that's probably inspiring tons of people um but just not in, <laughs> in a the, very dark way <laughs> in a very dark way and i'm looking forward to the optimistic sci-fi to come back you know of what we can be and not what we may be. The old school Star Trek. Yes. Like the original Star Trek and Next Generation where it wasn't about war, it was about exploration. Yeah, give us, yeah, I, I would really like, again, I love The Expanse, but I would really like a show to like, and that's kind of like why I liked Arrival a lot, you know? And even though I had some issues with Interstellar, I liked the spirit of Interstellar, which is like, we can do great things if we put our mind to it. Um, you mentioned you were doing some comics. Are those available for people to find somehow there online? There is one. I, I don't. I wouldn't consider it particularly. Yeah, it's it's all right. I haven't read it in like a couple of years. It's okay. It's called In the Ether, um, and the aspect I've always wanted to get into was, as much as I love all the sci-fi that's out, dude. I I don't think there's like a mainstream that has a connect the astronomical connection with the rest of it you know like think is there any sci-fi you can think of where people just go up and look at the stars you know like you remember that scene in the new star trek where captain kirk he's driving in iowa and he comes to the um they're building the enterprise you know i always thought just because of the canon of it that not only because of the canon of it it might have been interesting if on that road he saw the belt of the Milky Way and he wondered what was out there because that's what Star Trek is, you know? And so in my comic, I do have a scene where he just looks up at the sky and this is what it's all about. Um, hopefully, I'll be able to finish it, this third one again, and be able to talk about it more in depth. But until that one comes out, I'm just kind of like, just one another one of those people that's saying like I'm writing a novel, you know, but never <laughs> it's a novel. But at least I have two comics under my belt. But so hopefully, I will get back to this one. Uh, and, and so along those same lines, before we get into our main questions, sure. where where can find people find more information about you? And then w while we're at it as well, uh, Griffith Observatory. Um, Griffith Observatory, you just go to their website. Um, I don't have like a big presence like on the web. I don't have any presence on the website at all. And you know, when you go up there, I'd be 
tucked away someplace where you couldn't find me. But my website is guzi, uh, guzillustrator.com. So it's just G-U-Z illustrator.com. You can find a lot of my work there. And like all artists, every time I look at my work, I'm just like, nope, can't look at my work. You, know? <laughs> just, you just find, you just see all the human aspects of it and you see all the little flaws that probably no one else has seen, but you're just like, I can't believe I did that, you know? Well, it's never good enough, always it's never good. It's never good enough. There's a, a good quote by a comic book artist named John Romita who's like, never think your last work was your best work because if it is, you just quit. <laughs> just put it up, walk away, you're done. No, you, you always think you can do better. All right, let's go into uh, uh, our general questions. These are the questions that we ask absolutely everyone. Sure. Uh, all right. Uh, first question is, moon or Mars first? I'm going to say moon. And I, I'll tell you why. Even though we've been to the moon, it's the logical first step. You know, we set up there, and it's easier to get everywhere else once we're set up on the moon, I think. So as much as I would like to see a new world, right now I'm comfortable with the robots. But in terms of humans, let's get to the moon first. Let's, you know, let's take the right steps, even though we're showing a picture of a guy playing with a remote control rover. I say, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's something I always try to do with my art. I try to add like a little bit of humor into it. Um, I've been recently thinking of going more dark, but right now, and I actually haven't done like a, an illustration I can post in some time. Everything right now is going right to the planetarium show. But hopefully I'll have some spare time in the upcoming months and be able to get back onto it. Uh, would you go? To the moon? The, the question is, would you go? Fill in the gap with whatever you want. Would I go? Yes, I'd go. Wherever so would you fill in the gap with, by the way, to the moon, to space in general? Anywhere, I'll go anywhere. You know, it's, it's a big universe, and the one disappointing thing about life to me is that I won't be able to see all of it. When do you think humans will first land on Mars? <sighs> Optimistically, hopefully, 2035, but more realistically, 2050s. When do you think humans will set foot on the moon again? Sometimes I screw that question up and forget to say again. <laughs> and then the chat room yells at me, we've already been there! <laughs> so when will we go back to the moon? Oh. Well, we're going to have people orbiting it next year. Mm -hmm. um, but land, land, right? There's a very big difference between going slingshotting like Apollo 8 style and actually See, the thing is you want, foot like, on it. whatever date you want to set, you want to give 10 years <laughs> to them to develop it. So, like, I want to say, you know, 2025. 20, like, no, it'd probably be probably, hopefully 2030s by at least. All right, last question. Okay. This is, this is, this is the main one. Yeah. Why space? Because we're in it. We're part of it. We are it, you know? Space is, it's, it's the thing, this, it's this connection of, st this perspective of space that we're down here and space is out there. It's not the case. Like you look at all those stars, you think all the stars are part of this collective club, this cosmic party that we're just pariahs of. But no, when you look at all, when you look at all those stars, each one of those stars is as far away from each other as we are from them. They think they're the loner. They think we are the grand manifest destiny. It's not the case. All of us, everything out there is an equal part of this universe when you really think about it. So why space? Because it's us. That was a great answer. Oh, uh, Estevan, uh, thank you so much for taking no time problem. out of your Love Saturday. Uh, uh, it, that was a fantastic interview. All right, uh, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, comments from next last week's show. Comments from next week's show. That's going to be impressive. <laughs> I don't know how we're doing that. Uh, stay, <laughs> yeah, we got a TARDIS in the back. Uh, stay tuned. We'll be right back. <laughs>
And welcome back. Before we get started with comments from last week's show. Next get, week's show. <laughs> last week's show. Whatever. <laughs> we, we need to look forward. Testing like, the future. Esteban already said, we need yeah. to look forward. And so that's what we're doing. We have our Escape Velocity <laughs> patrons. These are people who have contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. We also have our Orbital patrons. These are people who have contributed $5 or more to this specific episode. And our suborbital patrons. These are people who have contributed $2.50. $2.50. And $2.50 or more to this specific, specific episode. They, of course, uh, they're going to get access to After Dark as soon as it's available on demand uh, and a bunch of other really cool things to find out all the rewards and different ways that you can help keep this show going week after week, month after month, and year after year. Head on over to patreon.com slash TMRO. We're a crowdfunded show. Every single penny helps us mm -hmm. a great deal. We have this incredible studio space. We're bringing on incredible guests. I hope you guys love what we're doing with the show. And if you do love what we're doing with the show, uh, you know, uh, Patreon is a great way to uh, help support the show, something that uh, hopefully you're getting something out of, uh, as well as you get, you do get things in, in return. So I, I don't like calling it a donation because you are getting something, like we give you something back. Yes. All right, um, Capcom, you talked to me about uh, last week's I'll try. Comments. Ugh. Ugh. So not Let's forward look thinking. Backwards. <laughs> History. The show is called Tomorrow. Uh huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> Last week uh, was uh, Paul Hildebrandt from Fight for Space. Yep. In case uh, anybody forgot. Hopefully y'all had y'all had a chance to uh, watch the documentary. It was Hopefully y'all really did. Hopefully y'all did. <laughs> this first comment comes off of YouTube from Laura Thomas or Lara Thomas. Uh, yay! It seems like India will soon have its own human spaceflight program. Yeah. You know the the more entity. Although uh, yeah, but the more entities that have. Capabilities of sending humans to space, the higher the chances Better. of humans going to Moon, Mars, and beyond. Yeah, right. there's a lot of us, a lot of us down here on this yes. rock. Quite yeah. a few. So, yeah. the more people yeah. who are trying to do it, the better. So, huzzah! Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Totally. yeah, the more countries, the more private agencies. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Not, yeah, it's it's only a good thing. Next yeah. up. It's a weird situation, too, with India because uh, they officially aren't working on human spaceflight right now, but they've been individually been working on all the pieces. Like, just last year, they had a successful test of their uh, new heat shield technology to successfully bring back a capsule. So it's like they're working on it, but they're not officially working on it. But all the pieces are coming into place. Do you, do you need to be officially working on it? To be, I mean, d does officially working on it actually matter? I mean, if you have the technology... I mean, yeah. Anyhow, yeah. All right, next up. Yeah. Uh, next one comes off of Reddit from Mr. Macabar. It says, uh, not moon or Mars should be first, but building an independent space economy that makes moon or Mars missions easier, more sustainable, and most importantly, politically and economically viable for an environment similar to today's. Uh, that seems a lot like uh, the Jeff Bezos vision of the future, does it not? Yeah. Right? I mean, mm -hmm. that feels like, right? Yeah, that, like, like Lunar 1000. Yeah, well, yeah, you, a little bit United Launch Alliance, yeah. but a little bit uh, Jeff Bezos. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I seem to remember, and anyone here, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Bezos talking about how he wants to, he's, he's not necessarily looking to go to Moon or Mars, he's looking to set up a space-based economy, whatever that might be, and that's probably going to be near Earth. Or is that, was that Tori that said that? That was Tori. Oh, Tori, yeah. Well, I mean, Tori does the cis lunar stuff, too. I thought Bezos was saying that. Am I making that up? Anybody? China. China. All right. I mean, you on? make up something. How Where are we? I've never. Uh, seen I feel, I feel like he. I feel like he is trying to like approach as many markets as he can. I mean, he's ta trying to tackle the whole suborbital tourism. He's tackling orbital delivery of payloads, he and just I mean, he's foods. also doing on, on a on a study to deliver cargo to the surface of the moon. <laughs> so. <laughs> so <laughs> game a lot. <laughs> you think store. Whole Foods is expensive now? <laughs> Wait till it's in space. Uh, Actually, <laughs> considering the current expense of when you go to Whole Foods. There's actually not going to be too much of you a difference. You won't see a difference? In how much it is. Just so. kidding. That's how we're mm. getting to space. Thank you, uh, Whole Foods. I mean, yeah. they bought Whole Foods for what? 13.7 billion? But you actually needed 15 billion or more to use your debit card <laughs> at Whole Foods. So. Uh, Jat Shirai, I don't know how to say that. Bezos is the one who moved, wanted to move. Dariachi? The, yeah, sure. Uh, wanted to move the industry into space. I hate you all. All right. <laughs> I was doing I so well with names earlier. Diria Chai. Sure. We'll but, figure it out. Yeah, I'm sure. All right. Yeah. 
Oh, for heaven's sakes. Okay. Next up, Capcom. That's the thing with new usernames. You're allowed to mispronounce them. This is true. I do it with old usernames too, though, so. Yep, 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 mm -hmm. yep, 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 yep. He, he does it with my name. Yep. <laughs> what's, your, what's your name again? Do, 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 <laughs> All right, next up, Capcom. This one comes, and I'm not making this up from YouTube. This is fantastic. The I love this. Is... I love this username. The real second Earl of Rochester. <laughs> <laughs> that is classic. Uh. Uh, so uh, this was a much longer comment, but the part that we took was roughly translated. Uh, no, no, no more non-disposable people going into space. This is an important topic. It's important for space, and it's important for gender relations. This is the point that needs consideration and real understanding without which we will not become an interplanetary species. No more non-disposable people going into space. Send the expendables. Oh, yeah, so, uh, is what so let's saying, see, what so. is that? Uh, it's Schwarzenegger and Stallone, Stallone and, and uh, Bruce. Is Bruce Willis? Was <laughs> I think Bruce Willis was one of them. Right. Uh, Jason Strahan. Mm -hmm. Oh so, ja no, we need to keep Terry Jason Cruz. down here. <laughs> Terry, Terry Cruz. No, we well, need to keep so. Terry here. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I guess I I guess uh, help me understand what they're saying because I don't think I understand it. Uh, so the, the part that we cut out of are this comment says after saying, the Challenger disaster, Aster. I can't speak, I'm so sorry. After the Challenger disaster, when Christina McAuliffe was killed, they said no more regular people going into space. Uh, but no more non-disposable people going into space. But th that's that's something that needs to be addressed, right? Uh, it's important for space and it's important for gender rela relations. Uh, this is a point that needs consideration and real understanding. Um, basically, I, I think- Regular I th people should be I th going into yeah, space? Yeah, I think that's the argument, is that mm -hmm. no, 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 regular people should be going into space. Uh, kind of like things that we've always said, right? The more people we can get into space, the more people we can get to have that overview effect, the more understanding and the more uh, just sort of um, empathy isn't quite the right word for our planet, but you know, a, a lot of people say that you know, you get up there and then you don't see those borders like you do on a map. Mm, sure. Right, and so we're just the people all together, floating around in space on one rock, and that's all we have. And then all of a sudden you have a much more uh, global uh, consideration and understanding of who we are, where we are, and where we need to get to, I think is, uh, and if the second, if the real second Earl of Rochester. Uh, is there a fake second Earl of Rochester? Needs to correct me. Uh, I will <laughs> certainly take that debate I, on. I think there was a point that Paul made that, uh, you know, Krista McAuliffe was somebody that a lot of new people could connect with because... Go to your camera. My camera is the back of my head. That's fine. <laughs> because the... Oh my God, that's amazing! <laughs> We've ruined the hologram effect! No. Um, we, Hi everyone. Previously, <laughs> all, of the, all of the astronauts were fighter pilots and test pilots and right. you know mm -hmm. military personnel and they've been trained to do this and this and that. And Kristen, Kristen McAuliffe was just a, a regular person. She was a teacher. So people were able to connect with her because she was a teacher, because she was still blown away by spaceflight and how cool it is to be able to get this opportunity to go to space and things like that. So a lot of people rallied around her and were, were able to connect to her in that respect. And we don't have that in any of the astronaut class. Everybody's, you know, super science literate and, you know, doctors and physicists and astronomers and test pilots. And, you know, I, I'm just a dude. How do I how do I connect with them? That's that is a good A, Space Mike, you're hilarious. Uh, B, that is a very <laughs> good that is a very good point. All right, all right. Yeah, gravity is restored. Gravity is restored. There you go. Uh, that is a good point. Is um, our astronauts are not very relatable anymore. Although I feel like the latest astronaut class, for whatever reason, seems super relatable. Am I No, I feel that way too. It so. it may be that we're getting closer to that, but I think it needs to go farther. To, well, where, to where just just a regular dude. What 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 specifically? What amazing thing have you done in your life? Nothing. I'm an astronaut. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, okay. But we'll get there. I think we'll get there in our lifetime. Right. But I I think that's the way we need to go in order to be able to connect and make it real for the the large swath of the human population. I wonder is spaceflight right now too complex 
for regular people to go on on extended duration missions and things like that? Is that maybe the problem? Well, it's right impossible. Now? No, I think the problem right now is a regular person can't go on an extended mission, mm -hmm. right? It's so expensive. Neither, neither can an irregular they... person at the moment. Neither can an irregular person. Neither, neither can an extraordinary person at the moment. We can't do interstellar travel. We can't travel to another Sure, but planet. let's just, just getting people into space, just getting economy into space, which mm -hmm. is going to be the first step, right? Interstellar, all that fun jazz, that's happening not in our lifetime, most likely. But getting people into space, um, it's stupid expensive to do right now. I think that's fundamentally the problem. Yeah. And so because it's stupid expensive to do, we don't have a desire to send up the mere mortals, right? We want to send up the people that are going to be able to get the, the best bang for our buck for the role in which they need to, to, to do. Right. And so that's why we're in this situation. So in my opinion, the, the most important thing here is going to be to reduce the cost of this so that mere mortals can simply afford to do it themselves. Right, and and I think companies like Virgin Galactic and Xcore and um, even the balloon companies, um, Worldview, uh, uh, Zero to Infinity, Zero, Zero to Infinity, infinity is yeah. one of them. I'm thinking of is Worldview. I thought they were the satellite company. Are they? They're they're the United Worldview the satellite company. The, oh, yeah, they're looking the, the, um, uh, the the one in Tucson. But the companies like that, I think those are the ones that are going to create that that. Uh, price point where mere mortals can go. And the neat thing about all of that is we're only six months away. All right, moving on. <laughs> Next comment. Next comment. Wow. Uh, comes from YouTube. This <laughs> one comes from Brad C. Goodness. Uh, it says, uh, like Paul said, most astronauts have either military experience, STEM background, or both. And while those experiences do prep people for being an astronaut, it doesn't excite or inspire the majority of Americans. If we're going to have a larger space presence as well as colonize other planets, we have got to diversify the background of our space passengers. But I feel like that's where uh, this latest space astronaut campaign is. Dutta's points are all right. But from a NASA standpoint, and, and it's still stupid expensive to send people up there, mm -hmm. this does feel like a very diverse group. Mm -hmm. uh, it feels like they're very relatable people. Mm -hmm. uh, they seem fairly charismatic and social media savvy. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I don't I feel like it's not, gonna, it's not gonna be a thing where tomorrow, all of a sudden, half of the world is able to go to space. Sure. It's not a realistic expectation. It will be baby steps. And uh, I think I feel like this is a really good first baby step, is this next group of astronaut candidates, followed by Virgin Galactic, X Core, Zero to Infinity, so forth mm -hmm. and so on. Yeah, if it's, I may, I, I know... Oh, no, 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 I, I know you hate to compare things to the past, but if we go way, way back and compare this to kind of the first... Um, outposts and, and pioneering outposts, you know, when uh, uh, the Spanish were trying to, to explore the New World, and even later, after the United States was already formed, we were sending out small search expeditions like Lewis and Clark, for example, you know, people who were doing expeditions like that were specialists of, of a sort. And it wasn't until later, once, you know, a, a little bit of the territory was a little bit figured out, that they wanted to start bringing their families with them. And that is what I think drew, you know, where these forts were started to be created, where that eventually turned into cities because, all right, these specialist people want to bring their families with them to an area that they've established is now safe. And a whole industry starts popping up to support not only those specialists, but their families and all the people who are working in that system. And it becomes a more of a standard community that we're used to. And right now, we are in that specialist phase. You know, the, the extreme specialists who are qualified to go out and do these first surveying missions so to speak. You know, even though spaceflight, we, where you've been doing it for 50 years now, it's very much just this, the journey itself, just the ride itself of going into space is a very dangerous thing. And it's still in the realm of specialists. And it's not until uh, the, the space industry has opened up more. And if, you know, plans like United Launch Alliance is planned to have a thousand people living and working in space, not all 1,000 of those people are going to be specialists if that plan comes to fruition. A lot, a majority of them will be specialists, but a lot of them are going to be almost more in the service industry, if you will, supporting those people and giving us the type of communities that we're used to. And I feel like we are probably realistically a hundred years away from the first kind of forts that have more than just those 
those specialists that start bringing along their families and start bringing along the support staff of making people's lives comfortable. So I think it'll happen, but just this is the phase that we're at right now. I hope you're off on that timeline. I, 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 agree, with, mm -hmm. I agree with everything but the timeline. I think the timeline, I think we live in a time where um, <clears throat> progress happens at an exponential rate. And so uh, I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful, dear Space Mike, <laughs> so, so we're going to send the, the starship Nina, Pinta, and Santa, Santa Maria, uh, kill all the aliens, and most of the people in them are going to die. I would hope not. Well, that's what's cool. going to happen on as Mars as for any microbes from when we land. All, for it. all right, all right. Moving on, moving on, moving on. <laughs> Next comment comes off of Reddit. Go ahead. What? Did you, did you still have anything to, that you wanted to add to that? Sorry. To, oh, we'll, yeah, that's right. I, did, I forgot. We, we interrupted you, and I'm sorry. It's fine. What did you? Okay. It's a cyclical issue, right? Like, it's difficult, so you need somebody who's highly trained and who can actually withstand all of the pressures and do all of the things, because you don't want somebody to screw up on the thing, right? Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, now it's a really small number of people that you can or want to send, and, you know, because because it is difficult, then you can't do a whole lot, blah, blah, blah. Like, it's just, it's that kind of issue. Like, so therefore, not a lot of people have done it because not a lot of people are trained. Then you gotta train more people, and then you gotta send a couple more people up, and then eventually, you know, it's just like, that's, okay. that's all. all right. That's all right. really Next what I was time. getting at. That's yeah. the, you have to, you have to, did Yep. Next comment comes off of Reddit <laughs> from Brandon Mark. <laughs> Pick any day in 1972, and humanity indisputably can go to the moon and back. Now pick any day and today, and we indisputably cannot do the same thing. Nor could we next year or the year after that. Hell, people doubt we'll even do it in 10 years from now. When do we supposedly have a mandate, uh, when we supposedly have a mandate to achieve just that goal? Yeah. Yeah, that's to suck, Source. It does suck. We've taken huge strides. We've, since Apollo, we've continually taken steps backwards in our human spaceflight program, right? Apollo was the top. We, it's never been better or bigger or better than Apollo. It could do the most. It was actually one of the lesser expensive things for putting stuff into low Earth orbit. It was amazing. Then we took a pretty big step down and we moved to shuttle. Can't go to the moon anymore. We can orbit a bunch. It costs more than Apollo. It was supposed to cost less. We take a step down. We get rid of shuttle. We can't do any of it anymore. I mean, Soyuz can send some stuff up, but if we want to even build the International Space Station today, even the thing that shuttled it, if we just want to build the International Space Station, we can't do that. So uh, I am looking forward to, so that's the, that is the status of the space industry at this exact moment, if I'm taking broad strokes. The future does look bright. Mm -hmm. The future looks great. Space launch system, eventually bigger, better, more awesome than Apollo. You've got, SpaceX working on a rocket bigger, better, more awesome than Apollo. You've got Blue Origin working on a rocket bigger, better, more awesome than Apollo, which means we now, for the first time in history, will potentially have three separate transportation systems potentially capable of sending humans to the moon, Mars, or beyond. That's pretty incredible. The problem is we're in this weird in-between phase where or like we're not quite there yet phase where it's being worked on it's being actively developed and actively designed actively built but it's just not done yet so we just have to wait for it to be done and with all things aerospace for some reason it takes so long it takes so long and they'll be like oh it'll take two years and 10 years later they're like all right we're two years out I'm like oh, you said that 10 years ago so yeah yeah i still feel like the last you know, 30 or so years of spaceflight haven't been a waste. Because they haven't been, um, allow me to say though, sure. if we didn't have shuttle and we had Apollo instead of shuttle, we never got rid of the Saturn V, not Apollo, but we didn't get rid of the Saturn V. Imagine what we could have done. A lot. Ugh. So much more. But I also- So much more! I also wonder too, if the experience of things like long duration spaceflight and the management operations of operating a vehicle for all of that decades was... at a time sure like so... they're doing with the space station would have come as easy or would have come um, as well as things have sort of happened over the past 20 I'll, to 30 years. I'll make years. the argument and so... this may not be true mm -hmm. so I look forward to your hate mail um, <laughs> that Skylab did 90% of what, like, we learned most of what we needed to on Skylab, mm -hmm. not on station, not on International Space Station. Uh, now, there is mm -hmm. some long duration, like, vehicle operation stuff that we certainly mm -hmm. didn't learn on Skylab, but 
like long duration living in space, the operations of like, you can't treat this like Apollo guys, mm -hmm. calm down, give us some break time. Yeah. That's all Skylab, that's not ISS. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I would make the argument that Skylab was a more pivotal space station than International Space Station. That's Benjamin at TMRO.TV. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that like a lot of the NASA people that watch are upset at me right now. You know, and, and I, I just to be fair, I used very broad strokes there, right? So I, I was I'm say, absolutely maybe, sure that I are think details. if you had said that five to ten years ago, I would have agreed. Okay. Um, the unfortunate thing is that we learned a lot in Skylab's very tiny, short amount of time. Sure. And we've learned more during the International Space Station time. Have we? Listen, but if you were to take all of the time, like if you were to have stretched Skylab's time out across the entire time mm -hmm. that International Space Station has been going on, I feel like then yes, I would have, I would agree with Skylab part. But I think we're at that point now, probably maybe five years ago or so, where we like kind of duplicated everything we learned on Skylab, where we basically didn't learn a whole lot new, yep. other than maybe a couple of things, and I would have said sure, 90%, but I think from that point on is all basically new. Take into consideration too. You mean like too. learning new things about human space flight, right? Is that uh, what you mean? No, I mean like all of the things. I mean like growing general, vegetables. Because I, I, I mean like throwing fire out of the out of the freaking cube cube model. Like uh like all of those different how to uh, dock and berth and have eight different vehicles attach to the station at the same time. I don't think that was something that we learned on Skylab. I think it's something that we learned on the International Space Station. I don't know that was something that we could have learned on Skylab, but we definitely learned it on station. Like I said, if he had made that statement five to 10 years ago, I would have been absolutely on board. I think, I feel like, yes, it's really unfortunate that it has taken us this long. We like, you know, kind of didn't learn a whole lot of new stuff, just basically duplicated ourselves, duplicated ourselves, duplicated ourselves, duplicated ourselves. But then as of about five to 10 years, not even 10 years ago, five to seven years ago, I think nearly everything that we've learned has been new or new-ish. Take into consideration as well that uh, ISS wasn't quote unquote completed until the la the final shuttle flight. Which, mm -hmm. oh my God. That's just sucks already. That's, right? that's ridiculous. That, just, right? that, so, that makes so me you're, more depressed. So your concentration has been, has, for the last you know 20 years, or 12, it's been in the air 12 years? Uh, anyway, anyways, it, which, for, which, for the better part of a decade, it was being built, and now we've only just now which gotten goes to, to doing show, science. I mean, you're ultimately proving the awfulness of it <laughs> more than anything else. You know, one launch, we have I, Skylab. I don't disagree. But I'm saying that the, the science had, didn't really start until maybe five years ago. Right. I mean, the, the bulk of the science, now, I mean, the, the, the station is now being done, done being built. So now they can concentrate on doing science. And I, I, I really wish that Lisa was here to tell us more about a lot of the science experiments because they've been pioneering research into osteoporosis, uh, uh, multiple sclerosis, ALS victims. I mean, the sort of, just the ground applications of the, of the medication that they've been researching and developing. I mean, a lot of the, your, if you guys get flu vaccines, which you definitely should, a lot of those new vaccines are first tested at the space station because they can grow them so quickly and fight the, the fast mutations of all these different new uh, strains. I don't think I so, articulated I mean, my point correctly though. I, I mean, yes, I get that. But what I'm saying, so that's all science that's related to a station in space, but it doesn't need to be on the International Space Station. That just needs to be science in space. What I was talking, we, we were referencing like long duration stays in space, like mm -hmm. humans in space. What does it take to okay, actually so run space a space flight. station? Yeah, the human space flight part of this. What you're referencing is science in space. Now, I am not saying that space station hasn't done amazing science in space. It has. It has done all of that. That's amazing. But there's no reason why that needed to be on space station and couldn't exist on Mir or couldn't exist on um, um, Skylab or you know whatever. Right, so or whatever. exactly yeah. that science can occur on any floating space station, star star, right? Maybe weird, weird example. So, I'm not talking about that, I'm talking about like logistics of what it takes to do a station, how humanity can get out there and actually do additional things. I, I haven't seen a whole lot come out of space station with regards to new innovative things. Mm -hmm. I see that come out of Skylab, certainly, but then like I'm sure there's a little bit of stuff here and there on station. Actually, you brought up a really great point, uh, berthing and docking multiple vehicles. That's not a mere thing, or a uh, Skylab thing. That would be Space Station. Yeah, there was only one docking port. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So that's a really great example of where Space Station is doing 
innovative, new, cool things and mm -hmm. like the logistics behind that. It's not just the technical side of it, but all the logistics of having to move things around. And that that's actually another thing of uh, them like picking up and moving pieces and modules of the space station. That is actually another thing that we did learn and will be important for space-based manufacturing. So I'm on board with that part of it. But again, okay, we've, we've hammered this up. This is all a roundtable discussion. Yes. This, this is a future roundtable discussion. We so. have a roundtable coming up next month. Every month it has five shows. One of the shows is a roundtable. Final, finally, finally. And I'm sorry for interrupting you, Space Mike. <laughs> I, so I did, oh, no, didn't no, no, mean no. to derail you, well, but I we I were... wanted to stipulate because because you guys were saying just generally <laughs> what we've learned at Skylab and the International Space yeah. Station in in a human space flight and what you guys are talking about. I, I for the most part agree. There's there's a, a lot of new things and just the logistics of working with all these different countries, mm -hmm. especially the formation of the space shuttle. I, I mean the space station. It's a miracle we were able to sit down at the table with all these partners and hammer out a deal in the first place. But um, the, what we've what we've learned, like total, the the amount of discoveries that we've made at the space station are you know monumental and affect people's daily lives. But from the human space flight and actually you know the logistics and the 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 the, the technical details of doing long duration space flight, yeah, I mean, we might not have learned a whole lot. I think that we've learned a lot of things of what not to do at the <laughs> space station. Well, that's still learning. Well, that's important. That's still learning. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, and before. I, one more comment on this before we go, and this is from, from our comments, uh, which is Seki, Seki? Seki. Seki uh, says uh, Beam is innovative, and, mm -hmm. and Beam is innovative, but it doesn't need to be attached to the International Space Station. Beam is a module as part of its own, designed to be part of its own space station. Beam is kind of testing the technologies for, you know, the Bigelow Station. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, again, that doesn't need to be International Space Station. Uh, that's, uh, I, I mean, that's that's basically trying to say we don't need space station, although using space station as a test platform. So mm -hmm. maybe I'm both yeah. making my argument and not making my argument at the same time. <laughs> I don't know. Next, final, last comment, and then and then we're out. How weird for you. Uh, next. That was an amazing. Who picked that comment? Dada, was that one of yours? Yeah. Yeah, that was a good. Boosh! We went off this way. All I look forward to your angry letters. All right. <laughs> <laughs> last comment comes off of YouTube uh, from Felix Winter. Says those kids were glorious. Winter is coming. The way they put their opinion was truly beautiful. I am in awe. I wish there were more adults that would make such an intelligent appearance. Yeah, I just, I, I, uh, yeah, I thought they were quite, quite well articulate. Better than I am, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> they talk good. They, they have, they learned in words. Yep. Um, they speak well. <laughs> um, I was sad at what they said, but I can't fault them for it. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, how, like, I can see where they drew their conclusions, and they're not wrong. And it makes me sad that that's what the youth thinks of the future, as it were. I don't think it's, I don't think that's how the majority of youth feels. I don't think the majority of youth thinks like that. That was an amazing, mm -hmm. like, they were pretty amazing. Uh, but, you know, the idea of, you know, we should fix our financial problems down here before we work up there, I think that, I, I, I would, I would think that a lot of people think that way. Mm -hmm. you know, fix our problems down here, you know. Look at look at the stuff down here. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a majority. Whether it's it's young or whatever, I, I think that's how a majority of people do think, and mm -hmm. that that was just a really great way of articulating that. So, yeah. yes, I totally agree. Winter, uh, yeah. All right, that's our show. I'd like to also thank our ground support patrons for helping to make this show happen. These are people who've contributed between one penny and two dollars and forty nine cents. Once again. Every single penny helps. You also get your name in the show, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, and we'll leave it up for just an extra second so you can find your name because that is getting to be a very long list week after week. And we do appreciate every new patron that mm -hmm. signs up over at patreon.com slash TMRO. That's our show this week. Next week, we've got Marshall Culpepper, the CEO and co-founder of, I think it's Cube OS. Uh, it's basically um, open source... Uh, software for like CubeSats and like doing things to help control these things. Sweet. It's going to be pretty cool. Yeah, so, it's spelled K-U-B-O-S. Yeah. And if you don't, Coo if you don't make the O-S large, it looks like Kubos. <laughs> 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 so uh, that's coming up next week. Uh, for those of you watching live or if you are a Patreon suborbital or above subscriber, After Dark is up next. <laughs>